Hi everyone, it's Angela with Broadhead Memorial Public Library here with another episode of Have You Heard? We are still, it's a new week, we are still reading Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim by Robert C. O'Brien and pictures by Zena Bernstein. Just a quick shout out to Athenium Books for Young Readers for allowing us to share the story with you. Okay, when we last left off on Friday, the rats had figured out how to escape their cages in the lab and had started exploring the lab. They, uh, they're getting pretty smart and they figured out that the best way out of the lab was through the ventilation systems. So they've been working hard to kind of tunnel through the ventilation systems, find their way out. When we left off last week, we were in the middle of a chapter and they had just finally found a vent that led them to where they could see the sky but it had mesh wire covering it, the end of it all right uh, let's find out what happens next all right Justin had a hunt. Justin ran toward it for a few se few seconds longer and then stopped. The sound of the machine had grown suddenly louder, changing from a roar to a roar. It had obviously shifted speed. An automatic switch somewhere in the building had turned it from low to high, and the air blowing past Justin came on so hard it made him gasp. He braced his feet against the metal and held on. In a minute, as suddenly as it had roared, the machine returned to a whisper. He looked around and realized he was lucky to have stopped. By the dim light from the sky, he could see that if he had reached the point where perhaps two dozen air shafts came together, like branches into a trunk of a tree, if he had gone a few steps further, he would never have been able to distinguish which shaft was his. He turned to his tracks, and in a few minutes he rejoined his friends. We had a meeting that night, and Justin told all of us what he had found. He had left the thread, anchored by the screwdriver, to guide us out. Some were for leaving immediately, but it was late, and Jenner and I argued against it. We did not know how long it would take us to break through the screen at the end. If it should take more than an hour or two, daylight would be upon us. We would then be unable to risk returning into the laboratory and would have to spend the day in the shaft or try to get away by broad daylight. Dr. Schultz might even figure out how we had gone and trap us in the air shaft. Finally, reluctantly, everyone agreed to spend one more day in the laboratory and leave early the next night. But it was a hard decision. With freedom so near and everyone thinking as I did, suppose... Suppose Dr. Schultz grew suspicious and put locks on our cages. Suppose someone found our thread and pulled it out. This was unlikely. In the near end, tied to the spool, was six feet up the shaft, well hidden. Just the same, we were uneasy. Then, just as we were ending our meeting, a new complication arose. We had been standing in a rough circle on the floor of the laboratory, just outside the two screen doors that enclosed the mice cages. Now, from inside the cabinet came a voice. Nicodemus? It was a clear but plaintive call, the voice of a mouse. We had almost forgotten the mice were there, and I was startled to hear that one of them knew my name. We all grew quiet. Who's calling me? I asked. My name is Jonathan, said the voice. We have been listening to you talk about what's going on. We would like to go too, but we cannot open our cages. As you can imagine, this caused a certain cons consternation coming at the last minute. None of us knew much about the mice, except what we had heard Dr. Schultz dictate into his tape recorder. From that, we had learned only that they had been getting the same injections we were getting and that the treatment had worked about as well on them as on us. There were, they were a sort of side experiment without a control group. Justin was studying the cabinet why not, he said. If we can get the doors open, someone muttered, they'll slow us down. No, said the mouse, Jonathan. We will not. Only open our cages when you go, and we'll make it out on our, our own way. We won't even stay with you, if you prefer. How many are you? I asked. Only eight, and the cabinet doors are easy to open. They're just a simple hook halfway up. 
But Justin and Arthur had already figured that out. They climbed up the screen, unhooked the hook, and the door swung open. The cages open the same way as yours, said another mouse, but we can't reach far enough to unlatch them. All right, I said. Tomorrow night, as soon as Dr. Schultz and all the others leave, we'll open your cages, and you can follow the threat of us to get out. After that, you're on your own. Agreed, said Jonathan, and thank you. And now, I said, we should all get back to the cages. Justin, please hook the doors again. I had latched myself into my cage and was getting ready for sleep when I heard a scratching noise on the door, and there was Jenner, climbing down from above. Nicodemus, he said, can I come in? Of course, but it's getting on toward morning. I won't stay long. He unlatched the door and entered. There's something we've got to decide. I know, I said. I've been thinking about it, too. When we do get out, where are we going to? I could not see Jenner's face in the dark of the cage, but I knew from his voice that he was worried. I said, at first I thought, home, of course, but then, when I began remembering, I realized that that won't work. We could find the way, I suppose, now that we can read, but if we did, what then? We wouldn't find anyone we know. And yet, Jenner said, you know, that's not the real point. No, the real point is this. We don't know where to go because we don't know what we are. Do you want to go back to living in a sewer pipe and eating other people's garbage? Because that's what rats do. But the fact is we aren't rats anymore. We're something Dr. Schultz has made, something new. Dr. Schultz says our intelligence has increased more than 1,000%. I suspect he's underestimating. I think we're probably as intelligent as he is, maybe more. We can read, and with a little practice, we'd be able to write, too. I mean, to do both. I think we can learn to do anything we want. But where do we do it? Where does a group of civilized rats fit in? I don't know, I said. We're going to have to find out. It won't be easy. But even so, the first step must be to get out of here. We're lucky to have a chance, but it won't last. We're a jump ahead of Dr. Schultz. If he knew what we knew, he wouldn't let us uh, leave us alone in here another night, and he's sure to find out soon. Another thing to worry about, Jenner said, if we do get away, when he finds we're gone, won't he figure out how we did it? And won't he realize that we must have learned to read? Probably. And then what? What will happen when he announces that there's a group of civilized rats roaming loose, rats that can read and think and figure things out? I said, let's wait until we're free before we worry about that. But Jenner was right. It was a thing to worry about, and maybe it still is. The next day was terrible. I kept expecting to hear Dr. Schultz say, who took my screwdriver? And then hear Julie add, my thread is missing too. That could have happened and set them to thinking, but it didn't. And that night, an hour after Julie, George, and Dr. Schultz left the laboratory, we were out of our cages and gathered, the whole group of us, before the mouse cabinet. Justin opens it, opened its doors, unlatched their cages, and the mice came out. They looked very small and frightened, but one strode bravely forward. You are Nicodemus, he said to me. I'm Jonathan. Thank you for taking us out with you. We're not out yet, I said, but you're welcome. We had no time for chatting. The light coming in the windows was turning gray. In less than an hour, it would be dark, and we would need light to figure out how to open the screen at the end of the shaft. We went up to the opening in the baseboard. Justin, I said, take the lead. Roll up the thread as you go. I'll bring up the rear. No noise. There's sure to be somebody awake somewhere in the building. We don't want them to hear us. I did not want to leave the thread where it might be found. The more I thought about it, the more I felt sure Dr. Schultz would try to track us down for quite a few reasons. Justin lifted the grid, pushed open the sliding panel, and one by one we went through. As I watched the others go ahead of me, I noticed for the first time that one of the mice was white. Then I went in myself, closing the grid behind me and pushing the panel half shut again, its normal position. With Justin leading the way, we moved through the dark passage quickly and easily. In only 15 or 20 minutes, we had reached the end of the thread. Then, as Justin had told us it would, the shaft widened. We could hear the whir of the machine ahead, and almost immediately we saw a square of gray daylight. We had reached the end of the shaft, and there a terrible thing happened. 
Justin, you will recall, had told us that the machine, the pump, the machine, the pump that pulled air through the shaft had switched from low speed to high when he had first explored through there. So we were forewarned. The trouble was, forewarning was no use at all, not so far as the mice were concerned. We were approaching the lighted square of the opening when the roar began. The blast of air came like a sudden whistling gale. It took my breath and flattened my ears against my head, and I closed my eyes instinctively. I was still in the rear, and when I opened my eyes again, I saw one of the mice sliding past me, clawing uselessly with his small nails and smooth at the smooth metal beneath him. Another followed him, and still another. As one by one, they were blown backwards into a dark maze of tunnels we had just left. I braced myself in the corner of the shaft and grabbed one as he slid by. It was the white mouse. I caught him by one leg. He pulled him around behind me and held on. Another blew face on into the rat ahead of me and stopped there. It was Jonathan, who had been near the lead. But the rest were lost, six in all. They were simply too light. They blew away like dead leaves, and we never saw them again. In another minute, the roar stopped. The air, the rush of air slowed from a gale to a breeze, and we were able to go forward again. I said to the white mouse, you better hold on to me. That might happen again. He looked at me in dismay. But what about the others? Six are lost. I've got to go back and look for them. Jonathan quickly joined him. I'll go with you. No, I said, that would be useless and foolish. You have no idea which shaft they were blown into, nor even if they all went the same way. If you And if you should find them, how would you find your way out again? And suppose the wind comes again, then there, then there would be eight lost instead of six. The wind did come again, half a dozen times more, while we worked with the screwdriver to pry open the screen. Each time we had to stop work and hang on, the two mice clung to the screen itself. Some of us braced ourselves behind them in case they should slip, and Justin, taking the thread with him as a guideline, went back to search for the other six. He explored shaft after shaft to the end of the school, calling softly as he went, but it was futile. To this day, we don't know what became of those six mice. They may have found their way out eventually, or they may have died in there. We left an opening in the screen for them, just in case. The screen. It was heavy wire with holes about the size of an acorn. It was set in a steel frame. We pried and hammered at it with the screwdriver, but we could not move it. It was fastened on the outside. We couldn't see how. Finally, the white mouse had an idea. Push the screwdriver through the wire near the bottom, he said, and pry up. We did, and the wire bent a fraction of an inch. We did it again, prying down, then left, then right. The hole in the wire grew slowly bigger until the white mouse said, I think that's enough. He climbed to the small opening by, by squirming and twisting, and he got through. Jonathan followed him. They both fell out of sight, but in a minute, Jonathan's head came back in view on the outside. It's a sliding bolt, he said. We're working on it. Inside, we could hear the faint rasping as the two mice tugged on the bolt handle, working it back. Then the crack at the base of the screen widened. We pushed it open, and we were standing on the roof of Nim, free. All right. The next chapter is called The Boniface Estate. Mrs. Frisbee said, Jonathan and Mr. Ages got the screen open? Yes, Nicodermus said, and without them I doubt we could have done it. The steel frame was strong, the bolt was secure, and the wire so stiff that we could not have bent it enough for one of us to go through. So we were glad that they were with us and asked them if they would like, would after all like to stay with us, since there were only two of them. They said they would, for the time being at last, at least. And now the journey that was to last, with some interruptions of almost for almost two years. Part of it were parts of it were pleasant. It was a joyful feeling at first, just to be free again and to get those laboratory collars off. And parts of it were terrible. I have made notes about all of it, and if the time ever comes when rats publish books of their own, I intend to write a book about it. It would be a long book, full of trouble and danger, too much to tell now. It was in one of the dangerous times that I lost my eye and got the scar you see on my face. But we did have some happy times and some pieces of great good luck. 
two in particular, that helped to explain how we got here and what our plans are now. It was early summer when we got out. We had known that beforehand. We could tell by the lateness of the light through the windows, though it was dark when we finally stood on the roof. We had no trouble getting down the side of the building, however. There were downspouts in the corners with plenty of tow holes. We dropped the screwdriver and the spool of thread into one of those, and a, a little lower there was ivy. We were all good climbers, and there was moonlight to see by. In less than 15 minutes, we were on the ground. Staying in the darkest shadows under the bushes we could, when we could, we sped away from Nim, not knowing or caring at first what direction we were going. Nobody saw us. During the next few weeks, we lived as we could. We had, in a way, to learn all over again how to get along. For although the world outside the laboratory was the same, we ourselves were different. We were, a couple of times, reduced to eating from dumps and garbage cans. But knowing how to read, we quickly learned to recognize signs on buildings, groceries, supermarkets, meats and vegetables, for instance, let us know that there was food inside for the taking, and once inside the supermarket at night, they always leave a few lights on. We could even read the signs on the wall directing us to Section 8 for dairy products like cheese, Section 3 for baked goods, and so on. In the country, there were barns and silos stocked with grain and corn and chicken houses full of eggs. Occasionally, we came upon other rats, and a few times we talked with them, but not for long because after just a few words they would begin to look at us strangely and edge away. Somehow they could tell we were different. I think we even looked different. Either the diet or the injections at NIM made us bigger and stronger than other rats, and all the strange rats we saw looked, saw looked to us surprisingly weak and puny. So we were set apart from even our own kind. It was a while, it was a while we were in the country that we had our own first important stroke of luck. We had just about decided after nearly four months of freedom to, con to constant roving to find a place to settle down, if not permanently, at least for the winter. We thought that it should be in the country, but not too far from a town so that we would have access to grocery stores as well as barns and gardens. It was about this time, too, that I began to wonder and worry somewhat about the fact that whatever we ate, whatever we needed, must always be stolen. Rats had always lived that way, and yet, why? I talked to some of the others about this. It was the beginning of the discontent and an idea that kept growing, although slowly. The season was autumn. We were walking one evening down a winding country road. We never walked really on the road, but along the edge so that we could vanish into the bushes or a ditch if anyone came along. You can imagine that 20 rats and two mice traveling in a procession would cause some comment, and we did not want that. As we walked, we reached a very high fence of wrought iron, the kind that looks like a row of black iron spears fastened together with pointed tops an expensive fence surrounding a large estate with a big expensive looking house in the middle and well-kept grounds and gardens. We walked along past this fence until we reached the gate. There's nobody living in there, said Justin. How do you know? The gate's padlocked and look, dead weeds standing outside of it, not even bent. Nobody's driven in here for a while. The house had a quiet, deserted look. There was a mailbox in front hanging open, empty. I wondered if we could get in, Jenner said. Why should we? It's a big place. It would have a big pantry, a big cupboard, big freezer. If it's as empty as it looks, we turned into the grounds, moving cautiously, and from beneath some bushes we watched the windows. As dusk fell, lights came on in several of them, but up st both upstairs and down. Jenner said, that's supposed to make us think someone's there. Yes, said Justin, but there isn't. I could see one of the lamps when it came on. There was nobody near it, and they all came on at the same time. Automatic switches to keep burglars away. Well, they're not keeping me away, said Justin. He ran to the house, climbed to one of the window sills, and looked in. He tried another. Then he came back. Nobody, he said. So we went in. We found a small window in the back with a cracked pane, knocked out one corner of the glass, and climbed through. At first we planned to just look for food. 
We found it, too, enough to last us for a year or more. As Jenner had predicted, there was a big freezer, well stocked, bread, meat, vegetables, everything, and a whole room full of shelves covered with canned food. The cans baffled us at first, as they had in the grocery stores. We could read what was in them, but we couldn't get it out. Then Arthur found a machine on the kitchen counter. He read the instructions on the side of it. Slide can under cutter and press switch. We tried it. The can slowly turned around in the machine and when we pulled it out, the top had been cut free. I'll always remember what was in that first can. Clam chowder, delicious. After we had eaten, we wandered around the house. It was a rich man's mansion with beautiful furniture and fine rugs and carpeting on the floor. There was a crystal chandelier in the dining room and a big stone fireplace in the living room. But the greatest treasure of all for us was in the study. There was a large rectangular room with walnut paneling, a walnut desk, leather chairs, and walls lined to, lined to the ceiling with books. Thousands of books about every subject you can think of. There were shelves of paperbacks. There were encyclopedias histories, novels, philosophies, and textbooks of physics, chemistry, electrical engineering, and others, more than I can name. Luckily, there was even one of those small ladders on wheels they use in some libraries to get to the top shelf. Well, we fell on those books with even more appetite than on food, and in the end, we moved into the house and stayed all winter. We could do that, it turned out, without much fear of discovery. We learned that from some newspaper clippings I found on the desk in the study. They were about a wedding, and most of them showed pictures of a newly married couple leaving a house to begin their honeymoon. The groom was a Mr. Gordon Boniface, heir to the Gould Stetson fortune, and the house they were leaving was the house we were in. According to the clippings, they were going on a trip all the way around the world. They were coming back to the Boniface estate in May. Until then, it was our estate. Oh, there was a caretaker gardener who came three times a week, and once in a while he would check the house in a cursory sort of way. That is, he would unlock the front door, glance around to see that everything looked all right, and then lock it and leave. But he didn't live there. He lived in a small house down the road, and we were expecting him when he came. He had figured out, from the way the place was kept up, the lawns mowed, leaves raked, gardens weeded and watered, that there had to be somebody working on it. So we posted a watch, saw him coming, and kept watching him. All the time he was there, and we made sure when he looked in the house that everything did look all right. This involved a certain amount of work. We had to haul all our empty tin, tin cans and other trash at night out into hidden places in the woods quite far from the house. We cleaned up after ourselves carefully. We learned to use the water taps and the dusting cloths we found in the kitchen closet. If the caretaker had looked more closely, in fact, he would have seen that the kitchen counters were somewhat shinier than they should have been in an empty house, but he didn't. He never even noticed the small corner of glass missing from the back window. And all winter, far into the night, we read books and we practiced writing. All right, well, we're going to stop there for the day. If you are participating in our summer reading program, you can go ahead and write down 20 minutes of reading time. And if you're enjoying these videos, be sure to like them. And you can also subscribe to our page to get updates. All right, well, I hope you have a fantastic day. And we'll see you tomorrow for more of Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. Bye.